foreign government. I work in a diplomatic mission. I can't be seen to be making contradictory views or statements that would be against the views and policies that the government have to make. That. So if you have to do any type of story or reporting on this, you have to link me to the NAC and not Vivian and Gray as a person because then I'm known outside of the NAC in the diplomatic service as a representative of this mission. Okay. I'm going to look very quickly at the using the human rights framework to address some of the issues um, and then ask the questions, what is the impact of some of these behaviors that we've seen on human rights, but more importantly, what is the impact on the HIV AIDS response? The framework for human rights has two parts, one of which is international and one is domestic. On the international scale, there is the International Bill of Rights, which is made up of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and the Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. All of these, well certainly the covenants have been signed and ratified by Jamaica. The Universal Declaration on Human Rights is not a treaty, but it is part of customary law. Customary international law is binding on states to the extent that the state does not object to the law. So insofar as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights says everybody has a right to life and liberty, and Jamaica has never objected to that then that becomes a part of the, the law internationally that Jamaica is bound by. So even though it's not a treaty that Jamaica has signed and ratified, the fact that it is there in international norms and we have never objected to it means that we are bound by it. In Jamaican law, we know the Charter of Fundamental Rights and Freedoms, which was recently enacted, has replaced Chapter 3 of the Independence Constitution. And so it is in the Charter of Rights that the human rights for Jamaicans are to be found. The rights can be categorized, as I said, into either civil and political rights or social and economic rights. The social and economic rights are new. They're, they're new and emerging, and so a lot of these tend to be problematic because people don't know how to deal with them. For example, the right to health. In fact, the right to health is part of a broader right that the international community speaks of, which is the right to the highest attainable standard of health. Um, people normally confuse it to mean that there's a right to health care, but the right to health is broad. It means that hospitals must have proper administrative staff, they must have pharmaceuticals, the environment must be friendly. So it, it, it's much, much broader, and these are the ones that tend to be problematic, especially in dealing with HIV and AIDS. Some of the rights that are relevant to the HIV AIDS response would be the right to non-discrimination, the right to the highest attainable standard of health and health care, the right to liberty and security of the person. When we come to the discussion about um, commercial sex workers, we'll see how this is important. The right to privacy, again, in, in, in the context of MSMs and sex work, this is a big right that has to be protected, and the right to equal access to education and of course access to information. But in two aspects, one dealing with laws that prohibit sexual intimacy between men, and then we look at the laws that prohibit commercial sex work. The first law is the Offenses Against the First Act. In sections 76 and 77 of the Act, there is a reference to whomever. So it doesn't say anything about males in sections 76 and 77. It speaks broadly to whomever shall be convicted of an abominable crime of burglary. And who in sec that's section 76. And in section 77, it speaks about whomever shall attempt or whomever shall attempt to procure. So there's no reference in those two sections to male relations. So it really applies broadly to anyone who participates in burglary. The challenge is that burglary has been equated with homosexuality between men. And so the law is disproportionately applied to, to, to male male relations. I don't recall ever having anybody, any heterosexual door being kicked in because the man was suspected to be having inner intercourse with his wife. And then and if you were to look at the court records, they, I can't recall a case in which there has been a successful prosecution of a man charged with burglary. Most of the time what the man does is plead out 
he pleads to a lesser offense so that he can get out of the shameful situation. Of course, you know what the courthouse is, especially the iron courts in Jamaica, like right? it's a big open room like this, mm -hmm. and so everybody can hear your business, unless, of course, somebody asks for the matter to be heard in private. And it may not apply to the particular case for the matter to be heard in private. And so to, to lessen the shame, the man generally pleads for a lesser offense and, and pays a fine, and the matter is over and done. In section 79, there is um, a, a reference to people who try to procure um, an indecent assault or an indecent behavior. But it only says, if any male person tries to get another male person to do this, whether by himself or with others. So the, the absurdity of it is that you could have two males in the room, because it says any male person who procures or incites. So you could have two males in the room and the female say, oh no, do it. And she's not, she's not doing anything wrong because the law says any male person who procures. And so it leads to a sort of difficulty because instead of focusing on the conduct, you start focusing on the behavior. And so that's part of the discussion which I think came up earlier. What is it that we should be focusing on when we're focusing about not, a, not having condoms in prisons? Is it the conduct itself that we should be focusing on, or is it the individual or the process? Sometimes the, the, the danger, well more often than not, the danger lies in the conduct. And in so far as this law in section 79 targets individuals and not conduct, it really and truly is overly broad. It's unnecessary, whatever the objectives are that it's trying to achieve. It doesn't achieve them because it means that a woman can procure two men to do this thing, but then one man can't procure another to do it, which is a little absurd. Of sections 76, 77, and 79 on human rights principles, it offends the right to privacy because we all know that, as, as, as the studies that you have seen, a man who is suspected of being a homosexual, he's not safe in his home, he's not safe in his community. And we've heard the stories of people being chased out of their homes and all that. So the, the right to privacy is endangered because of this piece of legislation. At the international level, in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, it says very clearly, no one shall be subjected to arbitrary or unlawful interferences. So in so far as a man or woman in any community believes that he has a right to climb over my fence and peep into my bedroom and say, well, I believe you're in there doing something with Tom. That's an unlawful interference with my privacy. And the state has an obligation to protect me from that. But more often than not in Jamaica, that doesn't happen. It offends against the rights to non-discrimination, equal protection of the law, and equality before the law. Um, because, as I said, the offenses against the person act it does not outlaw any form of homosexual activity between consenting homosexual women in private, and that's part of the danger of section 76 and 77 and 79. It applies whether in public or in private. What should be the mischief that if there is, a, if as somebody had said earlier, there is a belief that homosexuality in public is likely to corrupt public morals? then surely the restriction ought to be on homosexual behavior in public. But the restriction should not extend to the private spheres of the person. And so that's one of the reasons why the thing is offensive to human rights. The Human Rights Committee, which was set up to monitor and implement these covenants, stated in one of the well-known cases to have challenged similar provisions like these that we have in the Offenses Against the Person Act in Jamaica a case coming out of Australia that reference to non-discrimination on the basis of sex includes our right as well to non-discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. So a lot of governments try to avoid putting non-discrimination due to sexual orientation into rights charters. But the Human Rights Committee has said, even though you don't put sexual orientation in there in your public book sex, Sex includes sexual orientation. We Jamaica are, of course, the, the parliamentarians are very, very keen on those things. And so we didn't do that in the Charter of Rights. We put on the basis of being male or female. The impact on the HIV AIDS response. One, if there is no safe place to engage in intercourse, it may take place in circumstances which increase the exposure and risk. You probably have, um, you, you told me a term, um, I have one. When I, I was 
try to do a dry run of this with, with, with Ivan over the phone, what does he tell me to do? <laughs> but like something which I think it is synonymous with cut and go or something. Liquor. Yes, liquor. Run. <laughs> Being homosexual may result in discrimination in the delivery of health services, as we saw when Anya presented, or failure to take up the service. I am not going to go any place where a person cause me to feel less of you, even though it might be healthy to do it. If you cause me to feel less of a human being to take up this service, I am not coming to you. It impedes access to healthcare services because they are not adapted to the specific needs. And in, when Pat was making her presentation, some of this discussion came out as well. The question is, how do authorities track and properly report and put epidemiological responses in place? It's something which is underground. How do, we, how do we do that? How do we know the nature and character of the disease if we can't interface with the people who are most, most at risk? So that's one of the, the biggest impact to people not being able to take up and be a part of the service. Can there be accurate reporting about the incidents, causes, and impact? The health information which the group should be receiving and which would protect them from avoidable harm may be curtailed. Since it could be interpreted because the law has what you call preparatory and ancillary offenses. So when Pat goes out into the nightclub, and start handing out brochures and condoms. She's aiding and abetting and counseling and inciting and procuring an offense. And so if she is educated enough about the criminal law, she's going to say, you know what, me and I put myself at risk of this, you know, because I can be arrested and charged. So it restricts preventive efforts. People will certainly not go out and do this type of thing. Failure to self-identify as and MSM mean that the healthcare professionals, and this is also a danger, healthcare professionals may remain unknowledgeable about specific needs of the group and therefore does not develop medical practice and skill to deal with this group. Because you never see an MSM before, every time you come before you, what is your sexual preference? Oh, I'm straight. I said, oh, but I'll just treat you as I would normally treat a heterosexual man. All the other things that come with him being homosexual are not being addressed. So the knowledge and skill that the medical profession needs to be able to do this is also put in jeopardy. I'm straight. I said, oh, but I'll just treat you as I would normally treat a heterosexual man. All the other things that come with him being homosexual are not being addressed. So the knowledge and skill that the medical profession needs to be able to do this is also put in jeopardy. Cens censorship laws. So that's it for the laws that criminalize sexual intimacy between men. The, the, the impact on human rights and the impact on the ability of the HIV response to be able to act, properly target and treat. The Obscene Publications Act in Jamaica in section two says, it is an offense for a person to trade, distribute, exhibit, produce, or has in his possession any obscene writing, drawing, print, painting, printed matter, pictures, posters, emblems, photographs. I can go on. And it applies both public and in private. How do you define obscene? Well, the closest definition I could get is Butler. It's a Canadian case. It's not something we discuss in the region. So the jurisprudence in the region is... So you have to go outside all the time to be able to find cases. So this is the closest definition you have. Materials may be classified as obscene if there's a risk of harm because of their degrading or dehumanizing nature. <laughs> How does it offend human rights? It offends the right to freedom of opinion and expression, the right to freely receive and impart information, the right to equal access to education. This Obscene Publications Act, as well as the Offences Against the Person Act, prevents MSM from publicizing personal views on relevant laws and sexual matters, reforms and other public policy issues of concern. And since it's out in the public, you probably have heard about um, Maurice Tomlinson, an attorney who had to run away from Jamaica because he dared to go out in public. And, participate in public life and engage the public discussion. One of the letters that he said, that he got, the one that was sent to him personally, So listen, Batman, when you're interested in anything you have to say, you must shut up or else you're gonna die. So when you have legislation like this, 
This is what is that it prevents, if, if we all have a right to participate and engage in public matters and public discussion, then this type of legislation will cause me, mm -hmm. if I am homosexual, to stay in the background because my views will not be respected, I can be put to death. The Obscene Publications Act and the Offenses Against the Persons that creates conditions for discrimination in employment, constant stigmatization, vilification, threats, and the violation of democratic rights. How does it impact on the HIV AIDS response? Invaluable behavioral research and publication into MSM and commercial sex worker lifestyle with drawings, depictions, illustrations, and recommendations may be branded as obscene. Because to talk about male homosexual relation, you have to, the mind and all of it has to engage the idea of anal sex. And if you're gonna have prevention and educational material, you're gonna have to have some of that in the educational material. Well, how do you do that when you have a piece of legislation that says that is an obscene or could be? treated as obscene. You can't have it in your possession. I was troubling Ivan to say, Ivan, bring some of the IEC material that you have. I'm saying, in a have none. He has some of it from overseas. But I was saying to him, maybe after my presentation, he oh, will take it from overseas. Because you can go to jail for having it in your possession if it is treated as obscene. <laughs> Even sanitized tolerance campaigns, brochures and images. You remember some time ago the tourism, party might remember, there was an ad put out by the tourist board, a billboard, and I think it was down in here in the Cadillacs too, with two little boys holding hands, showing how Jamaica was nice, and it had to be taken down. People went crazy to say how it was fostering and promoting two children holding hands, and it had to be taken down because we were facilitating and promoting homosexuality. So even a sanitized tolerance campaign could probably be seen as something which is obscene. Prevention messages targeting MSMs which focuses on risk associated with unsafe, unprotected anal sex may be suppressed. Of course, the impact of it is that it has an impact on the chances of controlling the spread of HIV. School material, we know the debate that took place some time ago when the curriculum, there's a particular book yeah. That's what I'm going alternative family. One of the carnal books in, 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 the, in the smaller islands have um, alternative family yes. as, a, as, a, as a family. And we mistakenly, because we have carnal in our um, lower high school, mistakenly imported it. The one we have the same title. Yes, but the difference is carnal. It wasn't a mistake. <laughs> yes, the official position is that. It was a mistake. <laughs> So even young people who are MSM in school may not have access to appropriate educational information. MSMs may not communicate openly with their healthcare providers. Withholding vital information would help be to help better diagnose and treat. The risk factors for HIV are increased for persons who are unemployed. So. A person who knows that he is homosexual is not going to put himself in danger by simply saying, listen, I have a human right not to be discriminated against. He is likely to shun his human rights to keep his employment. So that's it in relation to sexual intimacy between men. In relation to laws that prohibit commercial sex work, there's a Town and Communities Act which makes it an offense for persons to loiter and solicit for prostitution. In places like Canada, the word solicit is replaced with communicate. But, and I'm sure everybody in the media must know about this landmark case that came out of Ontario not so long ago, Bedford versus Canada. It was decided by the Ontario Court of Appeal in May that some of the, the provisions that exist in the Charter of Rights in Canada and some Sexual Offences Act were inconsistent with human rights. And so it was a, you probably see it as, per year, it as a sex worker's case, because it was sex workers who challenged these provisions about whether they could solicit in public, communicate in public, and, and, and do their, their work in private. And of course, their contentions were upheld. I'll tell you some more about those. But 
much of the discussion that takes place in relation to provisions like this says they are not inconsistent with human rights principles because you have to prevent nuisances in public places that are prostitutes and the actual solicitation. There is section 23 2 which says if a judge is made to understand by anybody who swears to this that they suspect any house, this is how overly broad the legislation is, any house or part of a house is being used for prostitution and any person residing in the house, any person to reside here, frequenting the house, or is living off the earnings of a prostitute, then the judge can issue a warrant for the house to be searched and to seize any material there and to arrest any person. So the offense is not that the judge and the, the state has thought to do that. It is that the, it, it, it kicks in on a mere suspicion. It applies to any house and it applies to any person residing in our frequency. Whatever the objective is, if it is to protect public health, is this overly broad? Can you achieve the objective by being less intrusive? Uh, brothels, any premises, any premises suspected of being used as a brothel can be raided and closed and whatever material is found there is used in evidence against a person. The impact on the Human Rights Act is that these provisions are overly broad. They offend against the principle that you must be proportionate in your response. The state must be proportionate in its response. So if, if the goal is, to, is public health, it doesn't need to extend into the private realm of, of any house, any person's house. The fact that a person who is said to be living out the earning of a prostitute or a prostitute herself if found guilty has to pay a fine of $500,000 or be imprisoned means that the, 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 the penalties are in excess of what should apply to someone in that economic position. You, as, as I was said in a discussion earlier, the, the, the discussion has to take into account of the socio-economic conditions of the person. These things drive risk, and so it can be, the things can be isolated from all of those other factors. Overlook the fact that many people can choose to engage in sex work voluntarily. People might just like doing that. We're not saying we know, but it could be. The decision is to pursue sex work is a choice. Transactional sex. Yes, it's a choice about one's body, it's one's a sexuality. Crime. Huh? It's a business crime. In private, it is. <laughs> There's no victim. So the question that I want to you to consider is: How is sex work different from a choice to drink alcohol or smoke tobacco? Is there any difference between choosing to do the sex work and choosing to drink alcohol and tobacco? And why is it that there are no laws that say you can't? drink alcohol and drink tobacco and smoke tobacco. Argue that outlawing a person's choice to engage in sex work is offensive to the human rights of liberty and security of the person. It's not at large. Um, you can't just say that every activity that you individually want to do should be protected under 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 liberty and security of the person. It should only be those things that go to the core of what it means to enjoy individual dignity and independence. In Bedford, Canada, and again I recommend your reading of, of this case, this case confirms that the right covers a decision to engage in sex work as well as many of the decisions that sex work made in the course of their occupation. Im a further impact on human rights is that it diminishes the sex workers' access to justice because sex workers are reluctant to report violent crime or even crime committed against them by the police they will not report. The prohibition and living of the avails of a prostitute it violates the right to protection of life, family life and the privacy of home because even the living partner, somebody who lives with the sex worker, is in jeopardy of being charged because the legislation as overly broad as it is says any person and of course uh, a critical as, as pattern those people working treatment care and support will tell you you need to have a support mechanism around you so if the, pro if the person who engaged in prostitution is isolated from a support network if the person is already infected 
there's nobody to encourage them to continue adhering to their medication and stuff like that and if they are at risk there's nobody to encourage them to reduce their risk and stuff like that and so that is why it, 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 it it's such a dangerous provision it displays the sex workers and drives them into areas where they are unable because if you have to travel from Kingston to Montego Bay where nobody knows you and to meet a big man down there you could do it in the privacy of your home where if anything you could call your neighbor but when you drive to back to where nobody knows you there's nobody for you to call to for help for anything Criminalization of sex work means that the police can confiscate and destroy property including sex work because you can't have in your possession things that are to be used in furtherance of a crime. And if you're engaging in sex work and you have condoms, they are tools of the trade. And so they have to be confiscated. So let you, let you so it's absurd. <laughs> the, again, the prevention and outreach workers are at risk of aiding and abetting the offenses workers from working indoors in locations like brothels affect the way in which they are able to care for their sexual health because it's a safer environment they are more likely to be able to negotiate safer sex if the brothels have mechanisms and policies around condom use it's more likely that the, the sex worker will be able to insist upon it if there's an institutional arrangement for it when you hear in the HIV AIDS response that the People are calling for the repeal of the buggery law or the decriminalization of sex work. The, the call is easier said than done. This, this might, not, might never ever be done because it requires the policy makers to become aware of all of these issues. And so far, in my own experience, in, 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 in 2006, I believe, when the Charter of Rights was being discussed, I made a presentation to the Joint Select Committee asking for the right to health and the right to health care to be included in the Charter and that there should be additional grounds of discrimination, freedom from discrimination and disability, health status. And the committee said no. Why? Because if you include disability, people will be able to argue that homosexuality is a disability. That is a type of ignorance that was pervasive among the committee members and other people were saying well if we include the right to health why not include the right to air and some other nonsense in, in the thing so they were not prepared to engage on that discussion the judicial interpretation is more likely to be the route to getting the laws amended even though in the charter, there is what is called a savings clause, and a lot of all laws have it. A savings law clause that says, nothing done under any present law, which or any law which existed before the charter, if it is inconsistent with the charter, the law is not invalid. That's, that's the trust of it. But we have two cases in particular that went before the Privy Council, um, out of Jamaica. The Kirk Mollison case and Lambert Watson versus the Queen says that the judges have what in the constitution there is what is called a modification clause and this modification clause is that if, if any law is inconsistent with the constitution the judges can interpret the law so that it is brought in line with the constitution so you have lambert watson versus the queen and kurt mollison versus the queen in which that is exactly what they did so it is not that the, the, the tools are not there. As a matter of fact, in Kurt Mollison, it was the Jamaican Court of Appeal that said, listen, something must be wrong with a law that says we can detain a person at the Governor General's pleasure. A, a youth, a juvenile at the Governor General's pleasure. We will read that to mean that he can get a life imprisonment and the DPP objected. And so that's how the matter went to the Privy Council and the Privy Council agreed with the Jamaican Court of Appeal to say your power under the modification clause will allow you to do that but it's not in all cases if you have alternative policy arrangements you can do that other people have tried it these cases Rudal in Trinidad and Boyce in Barbados tried to use their own modification clause which is similar to ours but the Privy Council didn't agree but in, in our case in the Lambert Watson case and in Madison they both, they, the, the Privy Council agreed that it was appropriate to use modification clause to outlaw. People tend to think that the savings law clause saves the law from being modified. But in these cases demonstrate that it's not incapable. And 
if you can overcome the Lawyers Christian Fellowship, <laughs> you can do it. Because back in 2007, I was trying to lay, I was trying to set a book for the parliamentarians using Lambert Watson. Because in Lambert Watson, what the Privy Council said is that the, the Offenses Against the Person Act, you're contending that the Offenses Against the Person law predate the Constitution. The Constitution says any law that predates the Constitution cannot be challenged. But the Privy Council said, well, guess what? You have amended the Offenses Against the Person Act so many times. It's a new law that came after the Constitution. So what is your challenge? Look at the law that now exists to see if it was ever amended and bring it in line with Lambert Watson. Because that is the trust of Lambert Watson to say the law was ever amended. It's not the old law, it's new law. And therefore it's not saved by the savings clause. There is one thing I wish to say that it, it might not work for sex workers. <laughs> that might not work for sex workers because of a particular reality. There is the Convention to Suppress Trafficking in Persons and there's an organized crime convention, both of which applies to Jamaica, to which we are a part. Given where we are in Jamaica, we suppress organized crime, and the fact that human trafficking is a big deal, it might just be said that to try and use the modification clause to bring sex work in line with the human rights provision of the Constitution would go against other obligations, and so the judges might not be prepared to do it. And so that's the only key that I would add in relation to sex work. But apart from that, I will just leave you with why we need to focus on human rights. In the, the Jonathan Mann, who was one of the founders of the, 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 the system wide, the UN system wide response to HIV, had said very early. <laughs> In each society, these people who before HIV AIDS arrived were marginalized, stigmatized, and discriminated against become those at highest risk of HIV infection. The French have a simple term which they say, which says it all. HIV is now becoming a problem mainly for les exclus, the excluded ones, living at the margins of society. More repression will only favor, not them, but the epidemic.